we are live good evening all welcome to ifocus online episode 319 the 10th in the back to basics module today we have with us dr parthu pratim datta majumdar sir from shankar netralaya chennai to speak to us on essentials of ophthalmic anatomy part 2 Dr. Parthu Pratim Datta Majumdar Sir is a senior consultant, Department of Uvea and Intraocular Inflammation, Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. He has published many articles in various journals, written several chapters in various ophthalmology books, and edited many books. He is a founder and chief editor of popular ophthalmology portal www.eofthal.com. Sir is an avid book reader. has beautiful compilation of all the history of ophthalmology and it is a pleasure to read these articles across his web portals over to you sir thanks for that there was a nice and so kind of you so uh so my slides are visible yes sir they are yes yeah. so good evening everyone so today uh, is the uh, part 2 of the essentials of ophthalmic anatomy so if you have already attended my first class on essentials of ophthalmic anatomy where i have divided the entire topic into 26 sub topics category uh, from alphabetically from a to z and i i have named it as a a to z of ocular anatomy so in first part we have completed a to m and today is the part where we'll be discussing anatomical topic 13 anatomical topics starting with the alphabet and to z so uh, let's let's start so our uh, before i start as i uh, the first part i have dedicated this part also i am dedicating to my anatomy professors the pro late professor navarun purkasta and late professor abhinash chandra paul of silchar medical college so uh, our alphabet uh, first alphabet is n here now in second part and here we we are going to discuss the neuroectoderm now you have to remember that this is just an up, uh, outline simplified for the postgraduates so you have to read your textbook for the details discussion on embry embryological development of eye so coming to the neuroectoderm first you have to remember this mnemonic more so where the m stands for muscles of iris o for optic disc r for retina and epithelium of the inner eye now uh, when we are talking of the uh, neuroectoderm you have to remember that the eye and the surrounding structures arise solely from the ectoderm and mesoderm and there is no endoderm derived tissue in eye so coming here ectoderm and mesoderm let's see ectoderm when we talk about ectoderm that's there are surface ectoderm so you can remember with the mnemonic le where l stands for lens and lacrimal gland e stands for epithelium of skin cornea and conjunctiva so these are the three structure epithelium is derived from the surface ectoderm so now the vitreous the primary tertiary and the primary secondary and tertiary vitreous actually arises from the ectoderm so secondary vitreous mainly derives from the neuroectoderm and the primary and tertiary vitreous arises from the surface ectoderm so now coming to the mesoderm we have the following structures like the muscles of extraocular mus uh, extraocular muscles orbicularis oculi levator palpebrae superioris endothelium of all eye ocular and orbital vessels and the temporal part of the sclera with the sclam scanner so these are the structure derived from the mesoderm and as you can see you can remember them with m e s so where m stands for muscles e stands for endothelium of all the vessels and s stands for sclera but you have to remember that this sclera means only the temporal part of the sclera with the sclam scanner now rest of the structures as a rule as i told you this is a just an outline and you have to read in details so rest of the structure you can remember that they are derived from the neural crest 
so this is about the n so next we'll go to the alphabet o so here we have chosen the term aura serrata so this is a very important structure now the aura serrata marks the transition between retina and ciliary body now this aura serrata why it is called so because it is scalloped and or it has some dented anterior margin in of the sensory retina so at this particular transition zone or aura serrata the neuro retina is continuous with the columnar non pigmented epithelial cells of the pars plana so now what is special here in this aura serrata mainly the two unique structure can be seen here uh, in, in this aura serrata so the uh, the number one is your aura waves now what is this these are the rounded extension of the pars plana at the aura serrata now you can see here this is the aura uh, oral bay and uh, this is basically a, a extension of the pars plana here you can see here now the second structure is teeth like extensions of the retina between the oral bay and these are known as dented process you can see here this photograph here the yellow part is dented process which is a extension of the retina inside the pars uh, pars plana and whereas this one is the extension of the pars plana into the retina so this whole structure is known as aura serrata and here is your pars plicata and the pars plana so i think it is clear that which one is oral bay and which one is the dental uh, dented process so it's very important to understand the topography of this this structures because you can see here here is the structure uh, approximately it corresponds to the limbus and here it is the aura serrata and here is equator now if see the dimension wise it is important because it's it's a very uh, important landmark during vitreous surgery and various other procedure so the aura serrata is around 1 mm close to, uh, close to the limbus on the nasal side so you have to it has a different appearance it's closer to the nasal side than to the temporal side and it is situated 6 mm from the nasal limbus whereas from the temporal limbus this distance distance is almost 7 mm so from nasal and temporal this distance is there and the insertion of the extraocular muscles is slightly anterior to the aura serrata but it is closed enough uh, for the it is very close enough so it, it, it for clinical purpose you can remember that so i think it is clear the topography of that so the next important uh, important uh, uh, to understand is that the how it is uh, classified here as you can see here this is the aura serrata here and this uh, this is the structure which is known as the equator so equator basically is an imaginary circle drawn to the through the ampulla of the vortex veins so we'll read about the vortex veins in our subsequent slides so equator is an imaginary line drawn through the ampulla of the vortex vein now based on that these are the important la landmark and based on this the fundus is also divided into various other structures various other zone like the one is this one is posterior pole then the uh, re uh, the region between the posterior pole and the equator is called mid periphery and the uh, distance between the equator and the aura serrata is sub, uh, is called far periphery so there is no any strict rules for calling them or dividing them into this zone but most commonly these are used in our clinical practice so now this is very important when we are discussing about aura serrata and equator then you have to understand this now this is i think you all of you know the name of this chart this is known as this this is called amsler dubois chart so now let's see how these circles are represent uh, uh, represented here in this chart you have to remember this because in often it's a favorite question of the examiner in uh, practical uh, exam specially so you have to remember the what are the three circles representing here so if you see here the innermost circle circle is equator you can see the red color and red color here 
and the aura serrata is represented here in the middle. So many a time we confuse them with the outer one. So you have to remember that the aura serrata is the middle one. Now this part, the outer part, and this represents the anterior area, anterior to the aura serrata, and the junction of the pars plana and pars plicata. I think it's clear that this part represents the uh, part anterior to the aura serrata and junction of the pars uh, plana and pars plicata. Now, for example, a lattice between aura serrata and the equator should be drawn between the innermost and the middle circle. So you have to draw it here. If you are doing a lattice, then you have to draw it here, not here. So this is very important and you have to follow this. If you know, then only you'll be able to tell. And in exam, you have to document it in this way. So our next structure is P. Now in P, there are a lot of structures, but I have chosen a, uh, a, st a structure. You may think that why I have chosen it. It is palpable conjunctiva. Now, why I have chosen, I'll tell you in subsequent slides. So palpable conjunctiva is the part of the conjunctiva that lines the under surface of the posterior surface of the eyelid. The palpable conjunctiva is again subdivided into marginal conjunctiva, tarsal conjunctiva, orbital conjunctiva. The marginal conjunctiva is a transi transitional zone between the skin of the eyelids and the conjunctiva proper. Now it starts from the intermarginal strips of the eyelid as a continuation of the skin. And it is made up of uh, mainly uh, uh, stratified epithelium. Now this marginal conjunctiva continues into the back and posterior surface of the lid for a short distance of two millimeter. And this after that two millimeter of marginal conjunctiva, there comes a shallow groove or fold where it merges or mingles with the conjunctiva proper. So this group is known as uh, sulcus subtarsalis and sometimes it is also called subtarsal sulcus. So the most commonly it is called as sub, uh, sulcus subtarsalis. Now this sulcus subtarsalis is a very important structure, an important la anatomical landmark. Why? Because it is the most common site of foreign body lodgement inside the eye. So whenever any uh, uh, there is any foreign body, so usually we should examine everting the eyelid because this, this groove is notorious for the lodgement of the foreign body. Now, this structure also has another importance because sulcus subtarsalis, it is the place where the perforating branches of the marginal arcade pierce the tarsal plate to supply the conjunctiva. So we'll see how it goes. This is a very important structure that how it crosses and uh, uh, the marginal arcade branch from the marginal arcade. As you know, there are two type of arcade. One is marginal arcade and the peripheral arcade. This arcade actually pierces the tarsal plate to supply the conjunctiva. Now here, the palpable conjunctiva is a very sensitive structure and it is the place where the reactive pathology of the conjunctiva is seen in clinically. So mainly during the conjunctivitis, the, this, this, this is the place, the palpable conjunctiva, where we see the various kind of reaction. Now, uh, this reactive, uh, reactive uh, pathology can be broadly divided into, or you can call it the reaction of the conjunctival tissue to any allergic uh, component. So it can be uh, classified into broadly two. One is follicle and papillae. Now, the follicles are thought to be identical to the lymphoid follicles, as you see in anywhere in our body. So what happens, the pathology, the main pathology remains same. The follicle formation is characteristic of this mainly two uh, infection. One is viral, another is chlamydial infection. Also, it can be seen in some kind of toxic conjunctivitis, like uh, some sometimes uh, reaction to some uh, medications, some top, especially some topical medications or the preservative. So, on the other hand, as you can see here, these are there the lymphoid aggregates here, and here is the conjunctival epithelium, and here is the conjunctival vessels. Now, see in contrast what happens here in the papilla. So the papillae are composed of the chronic inflammatory cells, for example, the lymphocytes and the plasma cells, and distinguished from the follicles by the presence of the blood vessels at the center. 
the core of the lesion here is the blood vessel whereas here there is no blood vessels inside the follicle it is always there uh, uh, surrounding that so this is very important that the core of that uh, is uh, uh, surrounded by inflammatory cells and in core there is a blood vessels now this as you know that there are certain allergic conditions like uh, for example the spring catter or the uh, varnell keratoconjunctivitis and uh, sometimes you see the patients wearing the contact lens the uh, sometimes uh, uh, really can be seen in patients uh, with uh, keratoprosthesis and uh, uh, various other cosmetic shells and all no you when you see the the, the conjunctiva you can see this giant uh, giant, giant papillaries are there so this is the broadly the basis of the pathology of uh, between this follicle and papilla now this is very interesting slide and it's my one of the favorite slide also so for that for understanding that you have to know the blood vessels bl blood supply of the conjunctiva here and that's why i have chosen this this topic uh, uh, is p the palpable conjunctiva so here if you see this diagram look this diagram carefully the anterior ciliary arteries travel along the tendons of the rectus muscle and give off the anterior conjunctival arteries just before piercing the eyeball now this actually here there is the, the there there are the anterior ciliary arteries where they send the branches to the pericorneal plexus as you can see here pericorneal plexus and the surrounding region of the bulbar conjunctiva in the limbal area so mainly they serve the uh, bulbar conjunctiva around sur surrounding the limbal area so now these are the vessels predominantly involved during the ciliary congestion so that's why during the ciliary congestion you see the congestion of the anterior ciliary artery and the anterior conjunctival artery clear so how the ciliary congestion happens now on the other hand here the ascending branches of the peripheral tarsal arcade gives rise to branches that passes on to the superior fornix so it basically reaches the fornix and continue around the fornix to supply the bulbar conjunctiva as posterior conjunctival arteries you can see here the posterior conjunctival arteries here so posterior conjunctival artery they rises from here the peripheral tarsal arcade and here they supply the bulbar conjunctiva also so this is the posterior conjunctival arteries now in conjunctival congestion these vessels are congested and involved so now you understand the different set of vessels there that are involved in conjunctival vessel congestion and the ciliary condition so in ciliary condition the anterior ciliary artery and the subsequent branches of the anterior conjunctival arteries are involved whereas in conjunctival condition the palpable uh, arcade and from there the posterior conjunctival arteries are involved now the problem with that is we have to understand that there are pre anastomosis which is occurring between these two group of blood vessels like uh, uh, the anterior conjunctival vessels and terminal branches of the posterior conjunctival vessels there are some pre anastomosis which is happening and that's why they often don't follow this uh, this this grammar or these rules so that's why we see some kind of mix uh, congestion in certain cases of inflammation so that's the reason be, be, uh, behind that mix inflammation that there are some kind of uh, mix congestions happening here so now coming to the q uh, q is a very interesting i had to search a lot for uh, uh, this thing so here is a very interesting uh, uh, topic for you that is the quantitative measurement of the eye structure no i am not going to talk in details about this quantitative measurement of various eye structures i have made a table and i i feel and you should be that as a postgraduate student you must know and remember the dimensions of the various ocular structures like circumference of the eyeball volume of the eyeball what is the weight weight of the eye, eyeball and various other structure like anterior posterior diameter 
and then uh, what is the what is the thickness of the lens what is the measurement of the anterior chamber so for with this what i have done i have created a as a part of this teaching initiative for eye focus i have uh, created a three page pdf files which will con con which contains all these dimensions and values of eye structures so if you are interested, you have to send me an email here, drparthapratim at gmail.com. I will mail this PDF to you. So uh, this is basically about the quantitative uh, estimations of all the length and uh, uh, dimension of various ocular structure. This is just a ready-made uh, uh, hand notes. So when we talk about Q, so how can we miss the quiz time? So I have another quiz. And again, you have to mail it to me, drparthapratimgmail.com. But the time limit is if you are uh, interested to play this quiz, then you have to send this to me by today midnight. Because tomorrow I'm morning, I'm going to see this mail and decide who is the winner. So uh, you have to identify the corresponding structure in adders. The embryonic structure name I'm giving here, the transient nerve fiber layer of thebes and uh, which can be seen in you have to tell me which can be means which adult structure represents this and the tunica vasculosa lentis and which which structure actually represents that in adult so you have to send me these two answers right so let's now move to the next alphabet r now here obviously we can't think about anything so the most important structure the retinal pigment epithelium now, retinal pigment epithelium is a single layer of pigmented hexagonal shaped cells that are tightly packed together and it is situated on the outer surface of the retina facing the choroid. Now, each RP cell has a basal membrane that is in touch or in contact with the Brooks membrane and the apical membrane of these RP cells are in contact with the photoreceptor cells of the retina. If you see here, the photoreceptors are located here. And here is your Brooks membrane, which is uh, uh, over, uh, over which the retinal pigment epithelial cells are located. Now, uh, uh, the attachment between the retinal uh, pigment epithelial cells and this neural retina is very weak. In, in an experimental st uh, study, it, it has been estimated or it has been found that the it requires as minimal force as 0.25 millimeter mercury to uh, detach the retina from RP, RP cells to neural re uh, retina, it requires that much minimal force to detach it. Now, this uh, when we talk about the RP, often we, we come across this term called RP pump. Now, this what is this? Now, this RP pump refers to the active transport mechanism, which is uh, performed by this, uh, this, uh, this cells. Now, this, uh, this RP pumps, uh, pump plays a very crucial role in maintaining the both the ionic and the fluid balance. In clinically, we see the fluid balance. In molecular level, they also maintain the ionic balance also. Now, the, you have to understand this the molecular level, what happens, this RP pump, they utilizes the energy generated by the sodium potassium ATPase uh, uh, system. And these are embedded into the plasma membrane of the RP cells. What happens? These pumps actively transport three sodium ions out of the RP cells with the exchange of two potassium ions inside the RP cells. So they will move out three sodium uh, ions and will take two potassium ions there. As a result of that, there will be a movement of the ion. As a result of this uh, movement, what will happen? There will be a, a establishment of an osmotic gradient, which will lead the water across the RP layers. And water follows this concentration gradient, as I, I told that this three and three sodium and two potassium. So what will happen? There will be absorption of fluid from the subretinal space, and subsequent it will be released into the choroid, which will be drained by the choriocapillaries. So this is continuously happening, and this is why our our uh, our uh, uh, this RP I means retina is attached here, as you can see here. So. Uh, what happens, for example, there will be continuous uh, this this uh, this mechanism happening, and they are continuous throwing out the fluid from the from the retina from here. And when there is excess leak 
or if for some reason for uh, some particular disease or because of some age, this method, the RPE pump mechanism becomes weak or compromised, then what will happen? Then there will be a accumulation of the sub uh, fluid and we perceive them as a serous retinal detachment. So disruption or dysfunction of this RP pump can lead to retinal diseases like exudative retinal detachment or sometimes the retinal edema. It can be due to inflammation. It can be due to uh, some reasons like uh, 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 some uh, like uh, central serous chorioretinopathy. And uh, the ultimate result is in that uh, the, in this scenario, there is accumulation of the fluid either in the subretinal or intraretinal space. Now, you have to know as a postgraduate, you have to know the what are the functions of the RP cells. Now, I have a mnemonic for that also. So there are a lot of mnemonic we have discussed in this uh, part one and part two of this ocular anatomy class. So here you have to remember the uh, mnemonic RP fit. So if RP, RP is fit, then everything is uh, sub uh, so everything is fine. So let's see what are the, the first number one we have discussed retinal attachment. Number two, retinoid ma metabolism. Number three, renewal of the photoreceptors. Number four, with P, uh, P the photoreceptors of mat uh, uh, matrix production, protection of the blood retinal barrier. I think we have discussed this in our first class that how RP cells are responsible for the blood retinal barrier. And the E with E, you have to remember that the elimination of the waste from the retina to choriocapillary. This is also actually done by the RP cells. We'll be discussing this again in our next slides. And pre-radical scavenging. We, uh, because of the time uh, time constraint, we can't go into details, but pre-radical scavenging is a very important, especially when you read about the acute uh, uh, ARMD, then you will realize, uh, you understand that. Immunoregulation is a very important role of the retinal pigment epithelial cells and transfer of water and metabolite, as I said, it's, it's done by the, this. So this comprises of this RP fit uh, uh, functions of the RP cells. So I hope you, you'll be able to read that. Now, this is uh, uh, what I, I was uh, referring to. So one of the most critical function of the RP is that phagocytosis of the photoreceptor outer segment. You can see here the photoreceptor outer segments and this uh, this uh, this disc, uh, these are made, photoreceptors are made of numerous discs and these discs are on, constantly phagocytes by the photoreceptor uh, um, uh, photoreceptor, outer receptor, and this disc are continuously phagocytes by the RP cells. So in, 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 interestingly, it has been seen that the, this, this phagocytosis also follows a circadian rhythm and uh, 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 experimental study showed that this is, uh, this, uh, this is very, calm, it's very uh, high during the morning, early morning hours. So whatever it is, so this disc uh, will be there and this will go here and this will accumulate here. Now, within the RP, these outer uh, segments are encapsulated within the phagosome because they have phagocytes this and the, the end products are uh, reused to synthesize the new disc. So they will phagocyte this disc. They will again utilize it to synthesize the new disc. But there are certain, the end products will be also, there will be some end products which cannot be digested or cannot be utilized to create the new disc. So what will happen that will accumulate here and this undigested product of RP cell will cause a buildup of lysosomal residual bodies called lipofuscin. Now, when RP cells are diseased, then this amount of lipofuscin can increase in number. Like certain uh, uh, lipofuscin is known to increase with age also. And sometimes like various retinal disease, including, including age-related macular degeneration and all, this lipofuscin content may increase. So lipofuscin and uh, sometimes it becomes difficult because of the thickening of the Brooks membrane because they cannot be uh, transported back to the choriocapillary. So there will be accumulation of lipofuscin inside the RP cells. Now, not only lipofuscin, there are certain things, certain entities called uh, fluorophores. Now, what is fluorophores? These are the lipofuscin and the fluorophores are the responsible for a uh, important, uh, uh, important finding, which has been actually 
utilized in imaging known uh, as autofluorescence. Now, the autofluorescence of this retina is due to this presence of the several fluorophores. So they emit light when excited by a specific source of light. So they are located mainly in the retinal pigment epithelium and outer segment of the photoreceptor cells. And often they represent the diseased or various metabolic stage of the retina. Now, what are these uh, fluorophores? These are lipophosphine, melanin, A2E, or various oxy oxidized flavoproteins and adverse glyc glycolation end products. So these are the, the, uh, the um, theory behind the fundus autofluorescence. Now coming to the S, another very important structure, the supracoronal space. It's, uh, I think nowadays it's of, uh, in focus. So let's see what is it. Supracoroidal space is a potential space between the choroid and the sclera. Now, the inner, as you know, the innermost layer of the choroid is known as Brooks membrane. It is the Brooks membrane is compact and closely in touch with the RP. Now, the outermost border uh, of of uh, uh, of the uh, this membrane uh, is is a zone of transitions. Like uh, a, it consists of uh, various co uh, collagen lamellae and variable thickness. Very uh, variable thickness. So uh, the uh, uh, supra uh, supra space, the outermost border of the supra space is more of a transition because there are several collagen lamellae and the variable thickness. Until uh, recently, what happened that supracoroidal space was only visualized in the histopathology and was uh, demonstrated in vivo by ultrasonography, like in various pathological condition. For example, uh, when we uh, see uh, the visualization of it in uh, posterior scleritis, uh, all of you know that uh, we see the T sign. So the, the T sign occurs because there is a fluid accumulation here around the optic nerve and in the supracoroidal space and it gives a uh, alphabet T. So now with the advent of this uh, imaging and all, no, now there are OCT which has provided that this, this supracoroidal space actually can be seen sometimes during the healthy, healthy, uh, healthy state of uh, uh, eye also. So what is it basically? Basically it was uh, thought to be a potential space because uh, there was no such anatomical location as well. So that's why in some article, they, they, ha they have claimed that it was an anatomically silent uh, potential space, but it is very important why I'll be telling you now. But before that, let me touch few uh, anatomical highlights of this point. So supracoroidal space is continuous all over the circumference of the eye. As you can see here, it, it is, it is uh, it, uh, it it starts from here the palm attachment of the scleral spar which we have discussed yesterday so anteriorly scleral spar to post, uh, posteriorly optic nerve it is it is there and as you can see there is a circum it's mainly a circumferential because it's all over the choroid and sclera is here full cir circumferential so uh, you can see that so what happens under typical physiological condition that supracoroidal space is totally collapsed because of the IOP. Now, uh, we uh, that's why we call them a potential space because a space which is totally collapsed and there are some co collagen fibrils which, which is actually bridging the choroid with the sclera. So because of that, there is complete association and they are completely uh, 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 completely opposed with each other and in pathological conditions, this whenever there is a slight fluid, there, there, there this space can serve as a cleavage plane and can separate. So in, during surgery also or in pathological condition, you can basically separate the space. Now, what is the thickness of the space? It's uh, it it is estimated that it is uh, it has a nominal thickness of uh, 25, uh, 30, uh, 35 nanometer. So the choroid and uh, it, it is seen that the choroid and sclera can move over it. So because of that, uh, compact this. And if you uh, look into the histopathology of uh, this space, it has component from both sclera and choroidal stroma. From sclera, it has a collagen bands, fibroblast, and from choroidal stroma, you can see a lot of melanocytes uh, in this space. 
so this is how about this so let's now go into this yeah this is very important that the supraciliary space the concept of the supraciliary space is a, a, a little interesting it's a narrow area between the outer surface of the ciliary body and the internal surface of the sclera anteriorly so supraciliary space represents an alternative way for the aqueous humor to exit the eye and currently the most appropriate name uh, for the most probably uh, Mm, appropriate name for the non-trabecular outflow. Now, non-trabecular outflow, when we talk about the non-trabecular outflow, it includes both uvia scleral and the uvia vertex root. So, uh, in normal physiological condition, what happens? The aqueous humor from the anterior chamber reaches the supraciliary space via the ciliary muscles and then directed to the eye by the lymphatic system found in the connective tissue of the drain by the uh, various lymph lymph uh, lymphatic system found in the connective tissue of the orbit. So that's how this there is a lot of interest with this space, the supraciliary space. Now, the uh, various drugs actually can bring a lot of alteration uh, into the ciliary uh, muscle and can utilize this unconventional outflow. The classical example is the relaxation of the ciliary muscle by the atropine that increases the unconventional outflow. Even the drugs like prostaglandin, uh, prostaglandin analogs uh, 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 tend to relax the ciliary muscle. So allowing uh, the uh, 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 not only the acute reduction in this, this outflow resistance, prostaglandin analogs actually can release some enzyme called metalloproteases, which induces this remodeling of this, uh, this extraocular matrix within the ciliary muscle and can cause uh, transient lowering of the intraocular pressure. So there, there are various mechanisms uh, involved with this and there is a lot of interest over that. So that was about medical and surgically also, if you see, there is a lot of interest uh, uh, on this supracoroidal and this uh, supraciliary space. So if you talk about the uh, supracoroidal space, it has become a very hot topic for the posterior se segment drug delivery. Now you can ask that why it has become so hot favorite uh, uh, for injecting drug uh, delivery because this this it is very close to the coro coroid, coroid so that supra Coroidal space is a very attractive uh, uh, site uh, for uh, drug delivery. And with this route, it has been estimated that the chorioretinal concentration achieved with the help of this supracoroidal space route is 10 times greater than the traditional intravitreal injection. Yes. So the paper I have quoted here, you can check that. This the, it has been found that the concentration is sometimes it is ten times more than the intravitreal injection. Also, now this is very important. Here there is a one factor very important is the size of the molecule. For example, if you see the supracoroidal space injection of vivacizumab has uh, resulted in eight times higher concentration mm, uh, uh, in, in the choroid. Yes, in the choroid and significantly lower level in the AC where it is not required compared to when compared with the intravitreal injection of vivacizumab. Correct. So vivacizumab is relatively uh, 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 la big, uh, large molecular molecule size. Now, if you take a small molecule size experimental wise, for example, the sodium uh, fluorescent uh, uh, was taken. It has a very small molecule. It has a 14, uh, 40 uh, kilo del delta. So such a small molecule, it has been found that it, the concentration in uh, uh, chorioretina was 25 to 200 times higher than the intravitreal injection of the intra uh, intravitreal injection of the same drug through uh, sorry, intravitreal injection of the same drug. So that's how that's how this space has become very popular because it can attain a very good amount of uh, good amount of uh, concentration in the particular site, lowering the uh, other uh, other side effects and all. But you have to think about the potential side effect of you injecting some drug in this space which we'll be discussing now. So now after uh, injection into the supracoroidal space, uh, it, those uh, many people think that it will there will be a circumferential space, but it is not, not always possible. One, we have to, uh, described in the anatomy because it, uh, there are 
uh, scleral spar and optic nerve attachment, which will prevent the uh, transfer of the circumferential of the drug. And also it has been seen that the long posterior ciliary arteries and the short posterior ciliary, which are present in the, in this space, they also obstruct and uh, prevent the circumferential spread of the drug. So one has to choose the site of the injection carefully. Now, naturally, supraciliary space uh, is uh, suitable for uh, glaucoma surgery also. So, yeah, so uh, it's, it's a uh, very uh, uh, common site for the glaucoma surgery also. So, uh, supraciliary space actually can be utilized by two surgical methods of glaucoma. One is ab externo, one is this ab interno. So, however, you have to remember that both ab externo and interno, they need an open angle and may not be suitable for treating the cases uh, of uh, closed angle uh, glaucomas. Now, ab, ab externo, the earliest procedure goes back to cyclodialysis, which was uh, not done for the control of the glaucoma because it, uh, there were a lot of complication rate. Then this uh, gold shunt implant, uh, gold shunt came and ab interno, it is getting much popular. I think the subsequent, the glaucoma series of IFOCAS, it has been discussed. So I won't go into the details. Another two areas where this space has become very popular is gene therapy and retinal prosthesis. Now in gene therapy, the for uh, conditions like liver congenital anomalies, retinitis pigmentosa. So earlier what they, they were trying, they were trying to put the viral uh, vectors carrying this uh, delicate defective gene through the help of parts plana vitrectomy and then uh, insert into the subretinal space. Now, after uh, the lot of interest in this uh, su supracoroidal space, they have started delivering this uh, these viral vectors through this route. So that's why it has been a very popular route for uh, experimental uh, gene therapy. So next is the gene, uh, uh, retinal implants. So there, uh, there is a, one interesting study coming here, uh, uh, already phase one trial is complete. So the retinal implants in the supracoroidal space have been inserted in the three human subjects with the uh, end stage uh, retinitis pigmentosa. This papers, actually, if you read these papers, you'll understand that they provide the success of this supracoroidal surgical approach. And with the 12 month uh, post operative uh, data, and looks like this this will be a, this space will be a very uh, uh, hold uh, this space will hold a very uh, uh, prom prom promising aspect, uh, especially in terms of these retinal implants. So now uh, I won't go into the details, but as you know, the supracordial hemorrhage is very important complication. And as you know, there are many theories, many risk factor for supracordial hemorrhage, how they develop. But most common ca cause is that the hypotony and uh, uh, hypotony of the space. So what happens? Supracordial space contains uh, the long and the short posterior ciliary arteries. So the moment there is lowering of IOP or extreme hypotony, so this will cause the rupture of this uh, long and short posterior ciliary arteries and leading to hemorrhage within this space. So now coming to trabecular meshwork. So uh, as you know, the trabecular meshwork has broadly two parts. One is the anterior and non-infiltrating uh, trabecular meshwork, which is uh, not in communication with the uh, uh, supra uh, uh, anterior and uh, filtrating, uh, the, which is not in uh, communication with the sclems canal. And where is the posterior and filtering part of the trabecular meshwork, which is in communication with the sclems canal. So now this can be divided into uh, uh, three parts. As you can see this diag diagram, I have tried to simplify it. Here it, it, it shows the, these are all approximate. Don't think that it's a, the trabecular meshwork looks like this. This is just a graphical representation. So this, this, this represents this line represents the squalvis, uh, squalvis line and here is the scleral spar and as I have seen in my first class that they the trabecular meshwork joins here and uh, here is this iris tissue. So here is that net uh, net uh, net like structure which you, which you call, which is known as trabecular meshwork and here is the canal of sclam and this aqueous comes here and drains drains into the canal of sclam here. So these are the three part of the squalvis uh, sorry uh, trabecular meshwork. 
So one is the uveal, next is the corneoscleral, which is the largest of all, and juxta canalicular, which is the thinnest of all. So thinnest means it's it's like point, uh, point, uh, 0.1 to 1 uh, micrometer. And this pore opening in the TM is get progressively smaller, closer towards the juxta canalicular network. So as it approaches, if you can see here, here it is much wider, 25 to 70 five micrometer in size, then it becomes little smaller. And then juxta canalicular comes, it becomes much smaller. So there is this continuously, the size is getting smaller and there is a continuous uh, filtration happening here. So just two things you need to know as a postgraduate, which is very important that what happens when we give corticosteroid. In certain individuals, the moment we give a, a, any form of corticosteroid, there will be physical and mechanical changes in the microstructure of the trabecular meshwork. So what will happen? The glucocorticoid receptors and all, there will be cross-linking of the actin fiber. Secondly, there will be increased deposition of the substances in the extracellular matrix in, inside the trabecular meshwork. And there will be a lot of uh, uh, process going on here, the glycosaminoglycan and fibronectin production will increase. As a result, there will be a decrease outflow. Side by side, what will happen? The inhibition of the protease and trabecular meshwork endothelial cell phagocytosis, which is uh, the, uh, the uh, main cleaner of that a particular area, continuously they keep cleaning that trabecular meshwork, meshwork uh, pores. So when there is inhibition of this activity, so what will happen? There will be reduced functional activity of the uh, added material here when continuously there will be deposition of various material. So gradually what will happen? The pores will become in, in smaller in size and there will be decrease in outflow. And this will increase the uh, outflow resistance also. And there will be raised uh, intraocular pressure. So that's the mechanism of steroid response in a certain group of people. So we call them steroid responder. Now, naturally, uh, what happens when there is a there, there, there is UVIT? So uh, what will happen? There will be blockage of uh, uh, synechia, and there will be uh, blockage of the angle. And side by side, what happens in UVIT is the the inflammatory cells can go and block this trabecular meshwork. Can you see here? So if you com uh, uh, compare these yellow color uh, circles as a inflammatory cells, you can see this, these circles actually clogs the uh, tra trabecular meshwork. And that's why the, there will be increase in IOP. Similarly, certain viruses, especially the herpes viruses, what they do, they can actually go and uh, cause trabeculitis. So when there, there is trabeculitis, their pores are actually swollen and there will be the uh, have, uh, reduction in the drainage of the aqueous. And that's why we see that in herpetic viruses, increase in IOP is very high. So UVL tract will quickly go into the blood supply of the UVL tract because entire UVL tract, I have a separate talk, which I'll, I'll give you the link for that. So blood supply of the UVL tract comes from the posterior ciliary vessels and the anterior ciliary vessels. The posterior ciliary vessels includes 10 to 20 short posterior ciliary arteries and two long posterior ciliary arteries. Now, blood supply of the UVL tract is very important and asked, uh, often asked uh, asked by the examiners. So you must know about the blood supply of the UVL tract here. Now here, as you can see in the diagram, the 10 to 20 short posterior ciliary arteries enter the sclera to form an anastomosis. This is my actually last topic I'll discuss in last. And here you can see the two long posterior ciliary arteries perforate the sclera medial and lateral to the optic disc and runs forward to the supracordial space and then anastomos with the and anterior ciliary arteries. So this is again about the anterior ciliary arteries. Uh, so this has been already nicely covered in the this uh, eye focus lecture number 260, the uh, first uh, uh, first topic of the UVR series. So if you are interested, you can uh, see this uh, YouTube video. Now coming to the V, the very important uh, uh, is venous drainage of eye. So there can be uh, the mainly I, I, we can discuss this venous drainage in four headings. So number one, the central retinal vein. Now what happens here? The venous return from the capillary beds of the retina converges into a set of venules. So these venules originating from various quadrants, superior, inferior, nasal quadrant of the retina come together 
and ultimately anastomose to form a one central retinal vein, which we see at, at the optic nerve head. Now, this uh, central retinal vein carrying the deoxygenated blood from the retina exits the eye with the optic nerve and joins the superior ophthalmic vein. And from there, the blood flows to the cavernous sinus. And this, the, if you uh, see that the venous pressure in this CIV is very uh, same as the intraocular pressure, and it is it is very important. And another interesting finding is that that you can see the fluctuation of the uh, 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 pulsating nature of this venous uh, uh, central retinal vein. Often you see while doing ophthalmoscopy, which is uh, can be seen uh, uh, seen in 50% of the eyes, whereas the uh, pulsation of the central retinal artery is very uncommon and it is almost always pathology. So, now, just to summarize that pulsation of the central retinal vein can be seen in sometimes 50% of the healthy patient, healthy individuals, whereas the uh, pulsation of the central retinal line is uh, always pathognomic. No, now, coming to the vortex vein, the numbered uh, second channel to uh, for the venous drainage. So what happens here? It mainly drains the choriocapillaries. From choriocapillaries, the blood is collected in the venules. And this venule coalesces into the uh, collecting channels known as ampullae. You can see here the ampullae, venous uh, uh, vortex vein ampullae. So these are the part, part of the vortex vein. And this vortex vein, what are they? They are basically the uh, group of vein, usually four to five. And this vein exits from the eye with the posterior to the equator and ultimately it drains into the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein. Now, one important entity, I must tell you that choroidal detachment, it occurs when fluid accumulates between choroid and sclera. Now, uh, uh, the vortex vein plays a very crucial role here. Now, what is the role of vortex vein here? The vortex vein actually acts as a sink. It, it drains all the excess fluid drawing away from the choroid and that's how it maintains the balance. Now, pressure in the vortex vein is lower than that in the choroid. So that always creates a drive which, uh, uh, which makes the fluid flow towards the vortex vein from the choroid. Now, vortex vein actually, again, when they drain, uh, take the fluid from the choroid, they prevent the retrograde flow of the blood also. So that's why bar, uh, blood on, only flow in unit, uh, only one direction from towards the, uh, from the, from, away from the choroid to the vortex vein. So that is very characteristic of that. And here is a photograph, fundus photograph. Uh, you can see here that choroidal detachment, it can give uh, the here, as you can see, the typical quadrilobed appearance because of the position, as I told, four to five vortex veins are there. And it may actually, the vortex veins are primary reason which limits the anterior spread of such detachment. Coming to the anterior ciliary vein, it's also important to vein for uh, venous drainage of the internal eye. So anterior ciliary vein drains the venous blood from the anterior portion of the ciliary muscles and this vein returned uh, again to the muscular vein of the rectus muscle and from there it again drains into as it means all veins ultimately lead to the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein. Now, this is very important, the uh, episcleral vein. Here, what happens? So, let's tell, uh, discuss about the conventional pathway. So, in conventional pathway, what happens? Aqueous flow through the trabecular meshwork. And from trabecular meshwork, it reaches the canal of sclam. And from sclam canal, the aqueous humor enters into, there are certain like 30, 25 to 30 aqueous uh, uh, collector channels. So from aqueous enters this, those collector channels, as you can see here, those collector channels, they enter. And uh, from there is actually, uh, they enters the episcleral vein. And through this episcleral vein, it is carried to the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins and finally to the cavernous sinus, which joins the systemic circulation. Now, this aqueous vein comes in contact with the episcleral vein. There will be a retrograde pressure that slows the aqueous drainage. This is what we call, known, uh, we call, uh, call as episcleral venous pressure. 
Now, this is very important when you are you are uh, studying the glaucoma and various uh, these things that episcleral venous pressure. So, normal episcleral venous pressure is reported to uh, range between eight to ten millimeter of mercury. So, this is a diagram which shows that the how this twenty five to thirty channels, like how they drain into the anterior venous plexus and the collector vein, and finally this this is actually drains to the episcleral vein. Now coming to the white nails ligament. So this is a, I think Subhab and uh, Shaifali and Trutu will be uh, very uh, to discuss that. So just uh, uh, just for a, uh, give you a brief uh, briefing that white nails ligament is in a very important anatomical structure in the upper eyelid and uh, positioning. Subhab, can you can you tell us about that? Yes, sir. The vitnal's ligament is actually uh, a condensation which forms from the fascia around the levator palpebris superioris. It is also called as the superior transverse ligament. It is uh, at the level of the superior orbital rim and uh, it is a point or a demarcation at which there is a transition in the direction of the levator uh, aponeurosis where the muscle and the aponeurotic uh, uh, part uh, are delineated or demarcated and there is a change in the direction of the fibers of the levator which also changes the vector of pull on the tarsal plate and it is a transverse ligament which inserts medially onto the periosteum and laterally it blends with the pseudo capsule of the lacrimal gland it assumes importance because initially when process surgeries were being done uh, they used to take uh, or resect of the Vitnal's ligament, which would lead to a, a prolapse of the fornix because there is lack of support to the suspensory structures of the lid. So it also plays a very uh, crucial role in having uh, the anatomical demarcation uh, in the structures of the superior orbit, particularly when the patient is looking in up gaze. And it is um, uh, in a way that uh, all the procedures are performed beneath uh, with respect to the levator resection beneath the uh, Vitnal's ligament are called as standard procedures and those beyond it include the maximal and supramaximal resections yeah. so in the, practical, the practical implication is like if you have to do supramaximal uh, resection people go beyond the Vitnal's ligament uh, if it's a very very poor levator action, action. Um, on severtosis but ideally sling should be done in those. But if people have to try the levator surgeries, then it's like the supramaximal resection as they call it beyond the Vitnals. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. So, so, yeah. uh, so that finishes our W. So next alphabet is next alphabet is X. So here I have to struggle. So what I have done, I have taken the 20 seconds letter of the Greek alphabet. So Greek al alphabet, it's called, the Greek alphabet is called Chi. Uh, so the optic chiasma uh, is the place where two optic nerves come together and there has been partial crossing of the optic nerve fibers. So there is a point, as you can see, there is a lot of similarity between this. So for X, we have uh, chosen optic chiasma. So uh, what happens here, optic chiasma is basically a, it's a daily, uh, 8 millimeter long and 15 millimeter wide and 4 millimeter thick structure. And it's surrounded by membranes bathed in CSF, very interesting kind of structure. At what happens, why it is so interesting? Because at the optic chiasma, the two nerve en enters and emerges as an optic nerve. So a pro proportion of the axons from the left and right optic nerve decussets cross the midline and join the uncrossed fiber of the contralateral optic nerve. So that you, you know always as, as shown in this diagram, how they decuss it, cross the midline and goes into the other side. Now, interestingly, do you know that uh, which physicist first predicted the idea of this decussation of the fiber? Not a doctor. It was a physicist who first, uh, first uh, imagined that there must be the decussation of the fiber in the visual field. That's why the, our perception of vision is like this. Can you name that? So the first suggestion that the two nerves would partially cross the optic at, at the optic chiasma was made by no uh, anatomist, not an uh, uh, ophthalmologist. It was the Sir Isaac Newton. 
the genius newton first predicted it in his in his book and that's how the people got interested and then the subsequent research found that yes he was true now neopoptic chiasma is it uh, uh, there yes there is an entity called Wilbrandt's uh, knee. So what is it? It refers to the crossing of the fibers from one optic nerve that stray for a short distance into the opti opposite optic nerve before joining the optic tract. So this loop, loop of aberrant accents, very small, but generated a lot of controversy in the neuro-ophthalmology. But uh, till now, uh, whatever my limited research, this uh, paper you can read, there is no clinical perimetric evidence that was found to support this ex existence of this uh, uh, Wilbrandt's knee in the anterior visual pathway. Now, the optic chiasma, as I told, it is lies within the circle of Will Willis, a uh, circle of the blood vessels and uh, surrounded by a lot of important, important structure like floor of third ventricle and uh, there is pituitary gland. So naturally, this pathology is from surrounding structure involved the optic chiasma and a umbrella term is used called chiasmal syndrome. And it includes various pathologies. So you have to read about it, that pituitary, what are the causes. The most common is pituitary macroadenoma. Then there is cranio, uh, crani uh, pharyngioma, meningioma, and various other tumors can actually produce this uh, um, chiasmal syndrome. Now com coming to the yuck muscles. So uh, this, uh, this uh, as you know, that yuck is a wooden bar that is often fastened over the necks of the two animals, most commonly in cow in our country. Uh, so it, it is uh, what happens because of that, both the vehicle or the load, whatever is even the plow they are uh, carrying. So they they, they are uh, continuously, they can synch synchronize it and move symmetrically. So ocular uh, mortality also actually uh, uh, test uh, similar, uh, similar, uh, similar way. So how we do that? We just test the ocular mortality mortality in six cardinal direction of this gaze like here we what we do uh, the patient is simply holds the head uh, still and they follows the clinician fingers where where is the clinician uh, draws a capital H in front of the patient now these movements are all called yaw that means the extraocular muscle in both eyes are working together and mo move the eye in the same direction at the same time so this one eye does, the other eye does automatically. For example, if something catches your eye of the uh, left and your eye left eye moves quickly to focus the scene. So you do it con consciously and uh, you don't have to do it separately to tell the right eye that move the eye uh, uh, leftward. So this this is why this is this is so unique. No, so. When you uh, uh, read about this, this yoke muscles, you need to know the laws of the eye movement. And uh, this, I, I, I'm sure you are all, already uh, aware of this Herring's law and Sherrington's law, law, but sometimes these laws are confusing. So I want to share a beautiful uh, tips from this Twitter account of the Matt uh, uh, Biashi. So where, uh, who nicely illustrated these two laws, you can see here, and uh, 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 suggested that you have to remember that the Herring's law refers to the extra ocular muscles of different eyes. So they work together like Herring fish. No, here you see, he has compared it with a, uh, imagine a school of herring swimming uh, fish together. So it means that the, the extraocular muscles of two different eyes are acting together. And uh, here the Sherrington laws means the EOMs of the extraocular muscles of the same eye. The sharing, sharing, the sharing, uh, sharing eye. So it's the same eye. So this is how I think you can remember. Now coming to the Z, our last alphabet of uh, uh, th th this uh, workshop, this uh, webinar. So uh, we'll we'll go we'll discuss about a arterial circle. But can you name uh, the very uh, various vascular circle or arterial circle related to the eye? So there are basically broadly five arterial uh, five vascular circle. One is you know uh, first two are in iris, the major arterial circle and the minor arterial circle. The third one is the circle of Jean and Haller. And the fourth one and fifth one is a little less common. So you have to understand carefully. The fourth one is the episcleral arterial circle formed by the anastomosis between the adjacent anterior ciliary arteries. Mm. 
if you remember or you can go to my uvl lecture and see that how anterior ciliary artery forms a, a episcleral arterial circle and uh, the intramuscular arterial circle formed by the posterior ciliary vessel so these are the five what are this five one is major arterial circle second is minor arterial circle third is the circle of jean and haller the fourth is the episcleral arterial circle formed by the anastomosis of the uh, uh, anterior circle anterior ciliary arteries and fifth is the by posterior ciliary vessels so these are the fifth so today we'll discuss about the uh, circle of jean and haller so circle of jean and haller comprises of 10 to 20 short posterior ciliary arteries that enters the sclera and form an anastomotic ring here around the optic nerve this supplies the anterior optic nerve and the posterior choroid so this is how this is a very important uh, structure so now can you name some of the structure named after zin the zonathan zin who was a botanist and anatomist uh, uh, from the anatomist from the uh, 17th century so uh, uh, the number uh, one structure is zonular zin the zonular fibers or suspensory ligament of the crystalline lens the next is your annulus of gene or common tendinous ring that serves as a common uh, origin or uh, attachment site for the several extraocular muscles. And there are several other structures attributed to gene or named after gene, like uh, central artery of the retina is often called genes artery. And the uh, anterior layer of the iris tissue is also called genes membrane. But these are not routinely used. The most commonly used ocular structure is Uh, the, the, uh, this is the uh, this name of the flower is genia and yes it is right this is the flower genia is named after the famous and uh, botanist and anatomist Jonathan Gottfried Zin. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for such a detailed lecture on uh, ophthalmic anatomy. It was a pleasure listening to you again the part two and the part one. Uh, I'm sure that the postgraduate students will really benefit a lot. And also to stress upon the basics that they need to go back and also read through their books. Uh, so, uh, before we call it a day, I have a small announcement to make. Uh, we meet next on the 12th of July uh, for the lecture Essentials of Ophthalmic Physiology, part one by Dr. Pranesh Balasubramaniam. Thank you all and a very good night. Thank you so much, sir. That was like really creative. Both your lectures, we really enjoyed it. A to Z, how you took us uh, through all the anatomical structures and hope to see you soon again on Night Focus. Always a pleasure.